All right. Uh, uh, good morning, good evening, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, depending on from where you are joining, I have uh, you know lots of people joining from various places, and there are some more people to come. Um, uh, first of all, uh, let me introduce myself. My name is Anand Mahinkand. Uh, I am uh, coming from uh, California, Samahita Nature Foundation. And uh, the whole purpose of uh, uh, having this lecture series is uh, actually to uh, educate, to uh, create the awareness of uh, how the plant-based and why the plant-based uh, nutrition is important for us, our lives, especially in the Sri Lankan context. Uh, our country is not doing very well right now. You know, we have lots of uh, food shortages, uh, medicine, and uh, uh, in every family, it's very difficult to find a person, uh, at least a family, without having at least one communicable disease like heart diseases, cancers, or uh, diabetes, you know. Uh, so there is an easy fix for this, these problems. And so we have a great doctor, a world figure, to talk about all these things, Dr. Michael Klepper. He's a very, very busy person. Uh, anyway, uh, we are very lucky to have him here. Let me give a little introduction about himself. Uh, it's not easy to give a good introduction because there are so many things to talk about him. But uh, let me try, you know. Uh, Dr. Klepper is a gifted clinician, internationally acclaimed medical educator, and sought after speaker on health and nutrition and diet. He is the founder of his nonprofit, Moving Medicine Forward, an educational initiative to educate as many new physicians as possible so that together we all can reverse the cause of diseases through plant based nutrition. A longtime radio host and a pilot, Dr. Clapper has served as a nutrition advisor to NASA's space programs and on the Nutrition Task Force of the American Medical Students Association. Dr. Klepper is the author of the famous Vegan Nutrition, Pure and Simple, and also the producer of the uh, masterclass, Applied Nutrition and Plant-Based Disease Reversal, and has produced numerous health videos, webinars, and dozens of articles for both scientific and popular scientific journals and popular press. As a source of inspiration, advocating plant-based plant diet, Dr. Clapper contrib con contributed to the uh, making of the two very famous PBS television uh, programs, Food for Thought, and the award-winning movie, Diet for the New America. Uh, Dr. Clapper teaches that health comes healthy living. So he has featured in many uh, other famous movies such as What the Health, Vegan 2017, Cowspiracy, Takeout. I think, Doctor, I, I have missed so many things here. I think you featured in uh, uh, Folks Overnights, I believe. And uh, if I remember correct, uh, Eating You Alive. You know, those are great movies. And if someone has not watched these things, at least watch one of these things. Um, we can discuss these things at the end. Um, and Dr. Klepper served as the director of the Institute of Nutrition Education and Research from 1992 through 2015. He is also a member of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. So for me as, as a person, the most important thing is none of these things. So he's a very kind, compassionate, such a wonderful person. When I look at his face, you know, it, 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 there's a glow. <laughs> he's so nice. Uh, doctor, thank you very much. And first of all, uh, I have to again say that, uh, 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 you know, you accepted this invitation without asking what is my fee or anything like that. So, uh, it's very, very, uh, you know, this kind of gestures are very, very rare in this uh, present day world. Uh, anyway, um, with me, before before I hand, uh, hand over the audience to you, uh, I want to recognize few people. Uh, so with me, uh, Samahita Nature Foundation, we have uh, two uh, institutions actually working with me for this great event and for the upcoming events. Uh, one is SHRI, Society for Health Research and Innovations, uh, headed by Dr. 
uh, Anurudha Padini and Dr. Uh, Vasan Ratnasingham and also uh, local food promotion and monitoring task force attached to the uh, uh, the President's Office in Sri Lanka. Uh, they are Dr. Kumudu Dhanayaka, Dr. Harris Patirage, Dr. Sujiva Vikram Singh, and they are also uh, uh, here, right here, joining. And I know Dr. Clapper has a very limited time, uh, so uh, we don't know how he's going to manage this probably one hour, one, one hour, 15 minutes time. So after that, uh, probably uh, we have, a, you know, these doctors, uh, we get together and answer questions in uh, uh, Singhala and they can summarize what Dr. Clapper uh, uh, discusses today. Um, and Dr. give me a, another one minute uh, just to uh, speak a few words uh, in Singhala. Uh, so friends, uh, Mitro Runi, so may Saka Chava Pradana Singh of Pavatwane, Lankavi Metin Tatu again, a pay good at Katia Ledevela in anything, a pay a harapan, a pill on the a harapan, a ratawa, a harapan, a willing of the Kargan to pull one day, a pay a harapi, Ledesu Kargani Matagani for whom the Kinega, Gana Patina Denuma Kodak Adi, but he relocated the Numa at the Mitamatna, Sea Green Vardeneveno, Minisegan, Unandula, Tamangle Drogan, Nivar Nikaragani Mutta Utsuveno. It is a Piahar Higakali, a Pigavati and a Hargoda, you know, but a park chicken and the Bulon. It is a Piavak Deval Ganit Neh, Kadim Maragan, Masman Sadi, Aitagar Deval, Park Chikarmin, Ledevela, the Marilano, so a Pirate Janagahani, Marina Sankavin, Sita Superhack, Marini, Bo no one rogue. I get both in the Nine, a Piadana Harvelling, then with the Hanaka, Badi Rumogi de Gato, Sita Superhack, me Badi Rum, Park Chikaran, Saturna Kandin. A Petra Hari get a Padan, he took me the honey, the Salva sings at the Paribojan Sanda Yodaganim. It may have got a crassner. I did my very well our gun, Bohom Sutio, some Mandunata me, Saka Chavata. So I am now going to hand over the audience to Dr. Michael Clapper. Dr. Clapper, thank you and all yours. Thank you very much uh, for that kind introduction, and thank you for the invitation to address this very important uh, convocation. Uh, uh, this is an, a career-changing, society-changing concept that we are discussing here, and there's much to cover, so uh, uh, let me start uh, by sharing my screen here and, uh, and start to uh, play it full screen here yes got it okay um new um okay uh can you see the screen uh yes. mechanisms of disease reversal right. and uh, very importantly does it um does it now change to topics to be covered sometimes it doesn't change can you see topics to be covered uh, yes doctor. good okay if the if the slides do not change uh please uh, let me know so uh, as um, as advertised, uh, we've got a lot of information to cover here um, on the topic of disease reversal through plant-based nutrition. So what we're going to cover in this next hour um, are the clinical improvements that doctors all over the world are reporting when they get their patients to change from an animal-based diet to a plant-based diet. We're then going to talk about exactly what these foods are and why they might exert these specific uh, beneficial effects. To understand why plant-based diet helps, uh, we have to start at the very beginning and look at what is it in the Western-style diet that is infiltrating into the uh, Asian uh, cuisine and, and ever greater uh, degrees and uh, much to uh, the embarrassment of this American physician that uh, we have foisted our, our fast food culture onto the rest of the world here. Uh, but we need to talk about exactly what that kind of diet does to the human body. And then the most important thing is what happens when uh, the food stream is changed from an animal-based diet to a plant-based diet. 
We're going to focus in on two specific conditions to explore the actual mechanisms of disease reversal, namely atherosclerosis and type 2 diabetes. We're then going to quickly just touch on the literature supporting uh, the benefits of plant-based nutrition in other uh, inflammatory and degenerative conditions. And finally, uh, the role of plant-based uh, nutrition and dietitians uh, in actual clinical practice. So with that, uh, I'll tell you what you already know that in Sri Lanka and in throughout Southeast Asia, uh, coronary artery disease is certainly on the increase, uh, counts for 34% of deaths in Sri Lanka, along with strokes, the third uh, cause of death. Uh, and you've also had an exponential, exponential increase in heart disease, diabetes, high blood pressure. Uh, this is, of course, happening in my country and in uh, societies around the world as they adopt to the uh, Western fast food style of diet. And similar in my country, as in yours, uh, obesity is increasing uh, among all age groups and both genders uh, and with all the health ramifications of that uh, growth and girth. And like uh, most uh, Westerners, uh, the uh, average Southeast Asian person is eating more on a pretty much a daily basis, either meat, fish, dairy, fried foods, or, or um, excessive amounts of sugar and sweet desserts. Uh, this, again, is getting to be an echo of uh, the fate befalling uh, Western societies that uh, promulgate uh, this type of, uh, of uh, processed food diet. Now, my career took a sudden change, as well as my insights uh, into the effect of food on the body. Uh, when I joined the staff at True North Health Center in Santa Rosa, California, about an hour north of San Francisco, I was on their staff for eight years. Uh, and during that time, was, I saw hundreds of patients come in with the standard Western diseases, which again, you, you folks are also dealing with uh, rampant obesity. Most uh, Americans are either overweight, if not clinically obese. Now we saw clogged arteries manifesting as angina, claudication, uh, runaway uh, lipid levels, as well as high blood pressure, uh, florid type 2 diabetes, uh, and a host of inflammatory diseases affecting every organ system, uh, from lungs to colon to joints uh, to the immune system. This is the disease spectrum of Western medicine, which uh, Asian physicians are now dealing with uh, on a uh, more regular basis. So what did we do when these folks come in? Um, did we raise their dosage of uh, insulin and uh, beta blockers? Uh, no, actually we put them on a diet based on whole plant foods. Now there's a Western style diet. We'll talk about um, uh, foods that are more familiar to you. Uh, but at, at uh, True North, uh, we set out big plates of uh, oat porridge in the morning with lots of fruit and uh, slivered almonds. Uh, and lunches and dinners were similar. That every meal had a big, colorful green salad, hearty vegetable soups, big, generous helpings of steamed green and yellow vegetables, uh, and a, a variety of uh, hearty entrees, uh, curries and chilies and stews and soups, um, along with uh, associated grains, uh, rice, uh, millet, quinoa, uh, and lots of colorful fruit for dessert. This was the food stream that we would have our patients run through their system, meal after meal, uh, day after day. They would stay at the clinic for weeks uh, eating this kind of food, a big departure from the foods they had been eating. But the changes we saw saw uh, predictably were nothing short of spectacular. Medical school never prepared me for people transforming their health the way changing to a, fast, to a um, whole food plant-based diet uh, uh, proves itself to do reliably. Um, the folks who came in overweight or obese began to lose weight dramatically. Uh, three pounds a week, four pounds a week were not uncommon at the beginning. And the blood and the obesity continues to uh, decrease as the weeks go by. Arteries begin to relax and dilate. That allows blood pressures to come down. It allows us to reduce medications for hypertension. Uh, inflammation throughout the body subsides, especially in the joints and the folks with the inflammatory joint disease uh, get uh, relief from their pain when they move. Uh, due to the high fiber diet of this, uh, fiber quality of this diet, 
Now these folks often experienced normalization of bowel function. They had the first good bowel movement in years, some of them, uh, which certainly improved their outlook on all of life there. But again, seriously, uh, this, this really uh, benefited their gut function, which benefits the rest of the body. Uh, the folks with the eczema and the psoriasis as the days went on, saw these skin conditions improving. The asthmatic folks didn't need their inhalers so much. Uh, most folks got more restful sleep. And we physicians were able to reduce or discontinue medications for hypertension, uh, hyperlipidemia, uh, inflammatory diseases. And we witnessed a phenomenon called disease reversal. We saw these diseases actually reversing. Now, not being one to throw terms around, what are we talking about when we say disease reversal? Uh, we're talking about two specific uh, observable phenomena. We're talking about remission of clinical symptoms, the joints stop hurting, the lungs stop wheezing, the migraine headaches go away, as well as normalization of laboratory results. This is the hallmarks of disease reversal. And we saw these phenomena happening predictably. So as I became a student of the effects of plant-based nutrition upon the body, I began following the medical literature. And as I will share with you later in this presentation, there's now getting to be a growing literature uh, in the medical journal supporting the effectiveness of plant-based nutrition uh, for reducing uh, these nine common diseases that most of us spend our professional lives treating. Uh, I'm going to be focusing on the first three here, but uh, there's a literature supporting plant-based nutrition as an effective uh, therapeutic modality for all these conditions. So the focus of this presentation is why does this work? Well, how does a plant-based diet or how does changing from an animal-based diet to a plant-based diet uh, produce these remarkable clinical improvements? So, uh, uh, to understand or begin to understand, an automotive analogy might help us. Uh, imagine you're driving your vehicle and you look at the petrol gauge and it's reading on empty or near it. And so you pull into the petrol station. But as you pull in, you notice that the uh, the diesel fuel is six cents a gallon cheaper than the, uh, than the petrol. Um, and so the question for our example here, what if to save money, you filled your uh, petrol burning car's fuel tank with only two thirds with petrol and a third with diesel fuel. Uh, what would happen? Well, we all are aware that diesel fuel is essentially kerosene. It's, it's oilier than petrol. It, it just doesn't burn cleanly in a petrol burning engine. And so the results are predictable. Uh, the, your, the spark plugs are going to cake up with carbon deposits. The exhaust manifold is going to clog up. The catalytic converter will be ruined. Um, the black smoke comes out of the exhaust. Uh, the, the patient, the, the driver, say, my car has developed a disease. The car has not developed a disease that engine malfunction precisely predictably as it would uh, by putting the wrong fuel into an engine not designed to run on it. Uh, if you will, this is a transgression of natural law of automotives. Uh, petrol burning engine, they're supposed to run on petrol. If you put diesel fuel in there, you are violating a natural law. Well, uh, that seems fairly obvious to understand. Is there an analogy with our body's metabolic engine? Well, of course, and uh, we can look to other members of the animal kingdom uh, to give us a big clue here. Uh, the reality is, uh, despite the fondness uh, for meat-based diets, anatomically and physiologically, we're basically plant-eating hominids. And we have much the same digestive system that our gorilla and bonobo cousins have. And they spend their lives in the rainforest, uh, eating a steady stream of leaves and fruits and vegetation throughout their lives. And notably, they do not develop atherosclerotic plaques in their arteries. They do not develop type 2 diabetes. They don't develop ulcerative colitis in the wild. They do die of trauma and infections and parasites, but they don't develop the so-called diseases of civilization, big quotes around that, that we uh, that all of us clinicians have deal with these days. So uh, the clue would be a whole food plant-based diet is again, the fuel that this metabolic engine is supposed to run on, but instead of that fuel of the, the petrol in, the, in our petrol burning car, uh, most uh, folks in our practices wind up eating a diet um, based on overly processed meats, dairies, oil, sugar, salt. Um, this is the food stream, like that oily kerosene that we are running through our system. And our engine malfunctions as well. 
And in a typical day, many folks uh, in Asian nations have one or more meals that are just filled. You know, their fried foods are full of salt, sugar, oil, and oxidized meat fats. And we'll talk about them specifically. But let's talk about what each one of these meals actually does uh, to our body and to our bloodstream. I wish someone had told me this in medical school. Now, starting at square one, if one eats a, a meal of whole plant foods, as we are in, advocating, without a lot of oil or ghee in it, just you know, steam the vegetables, or use vegetable broth for sauteing, et cetera, uh, what happens as the vegetables get out into the bloodstream, uh, if you were then an hour later to draw the five cc's of blood into a red top tube and let it clot and spin it down to centrifuge and look at the serum, the serum is crystal clear. Uh, you can read newsprint through normal serum. This is what your blood should look like after you eat a meal. But if uh, one indulges in the diet of uh, meats and dairies and oils and processed foods, and you put that in your stomach and let it get absorbed. And an hour later, you draw that same tube of blood. What you're going to see after you take it out of the centrifuge is blood that looks like this. And it's quite like pemic, this is postprandial lipemia. And the, and the serum is filled with triglycerides and saturated fats. Now, I, of course, not everybody shows the fat as optically densely as this, but everybody has a wave of fat that flows through their arteries after a fatty meal. How, how can you not? Where else is it going to go? And the blood stays fatty for a good five, count them, five hours. Now, here's Kuo's classic study. Uh, they gave the patient a fatty meal at hour zero, and they drew blood once an hour for six hours. They took those six tubes and put them one after another into a spectrophotometer to see how fatty, milky the, the appearance of the serum is. You can see the blood getting fattier and fattier and fattier. It takes the liver a good five hours to begin, begin to clear the fat. Doctor, I think you got muted. Uh, one minute. Oh, my. Uh, let me see if I can get this up again here. Okay. Uh, can you see this now? Can you see the screen? Yes? No? C can you see the screen? Uh, we see the screen, but I we don't see your slides. Uh, it's a Zoom. I think just uh, Zoom. All right, let me on. Um, okay. Me on. Uh, now we right, see let me, the main screen. Let me share it again. Um, oh my. Okay. Um, screen sharing. So let me clear this out of the. Oh my unfortunate. Um, uh, can you see anything here now? Or does it just say Zoom? Yeah. Uh, can you see anything uh, at all? Can you see my slide? No. No, Zoom. Okay, still. let me uh, let me end this here. Let me. Are stop. you sharing the screen, Doctor? Uh, um, you go to share screen and. Oh my. Um, so let me try this and screen share. Okay. Okay, you got it. Can you see this? Yes. <laughs> okay. Okay, can you see this now? Okay. Yes, so while the blood is running thick with fat, uh, disease processes are being spawned. Um, uh, abnormal lipids, the uh, elevated LDL uh, increases as well as the blood is, gets more viscous, it's thicker, it doesn't flow through capillary beds as well. The artery walls get injured and stiffen, blood pressure goes up. As the fat flows through uh, the adipocytes in the abdomen, it's, the fat sticks there and obesity increases. Uh, as the fat works its way into liver and muscle cells, it interferes with the insulin receptors. And so insulin resistance goes up, blood sugars go up. We'll talk about that in a moment. 
And because the saturated fats are pro-inflammatory, that inflammatory reactions throughout the body are uh, promoted as uh, part of the uh, the uh, metabolic syndrome. So this happens after every fatty meal. And so um, so if one eats, uh, uh, again, a fatty meal for breakfast, for lunch, for dinner, and it takes five hours to clear each one of those fatty meals out of the bloodstream, uh, people are walking around with their serum lipemic pretty much, or their plasma lipemic pretty much all day. This is not a normal state conducive with health. No other animal and certainly no other primate, no gorilla, no bonobo uh, does this, but we humans have a fondness for inflicting this upon our system. Now I'm focusing on the fat here because it's the most visibly obvious marker of the effect of a meal upon the, the tissues, but there is more than fat in that blood. This is generally a high salt diet. Uh, there's salt in the meat, salt in the cheese, salt in the fries, salt in the chips, and uh, salt in the restaurant food. And we all well know that high salt diets can uh, stiffen the arteries and make fluid be uh, retained, raising high blood pressure. But we're also learning recently that high salt concentrations can uh, trigger TH17 helper cells to uh, open the door to autoimmune diseases like lupus. Who knew? But high salt diets are not uh, favorable for good health, for sure. And then there's sugar. Uh, we all have a sweet tooth. We have a fondness for it. I'm not talking about a little bit of uh, brown sugar in your tea as a sweeting, as a flavoring. That's what it was meant for. I'm talking about eating sugar as a food. Now, when you eat one of these classic desserts, um, uh, drink a cola drink, or eat a candy bar, uh, now you're eating you know, grams and grams of sugar as a food. And, and, and as a result, um, grams of, of, of fructose, maltose, dextrose flood through the tissues and they adhere, they stick to proteins all over the body. Proteins become glycosylated in the bloodstream and in the tissues. This is not a good thing because your own body heat will take these glycosylated proteins uh, and oxidize them into forming what are called advanced glycation end products or AGEs that are teeming with free radicals uh, that rip electrons off of cell membranes and chromosomes and proteins, very destructive molecules, they're molecular terrorists. And uh, these AGEs enter the blood either preformed if the carbohydrates were cooked at high temperature, like with chips and, and cookies, etc. Uh, but also, if you just eat the sugars, your own body heat will, will run the Maillard reaction in your own tissues uh, and wind up creating these AGEs. So this is how uh, a lot of AGEs come into the body through cooked carbohydrates and eating sugars. Uh, now, it's one thing to uh, to uh, have AGEs uh, produced on the uh, uh, on the surface of a potato chip or in a cookie, but you don't want to run the Maillard reaction on the proteins in your own body. You don't want to run the Maillard reaction uh, on the crystalline proteins in the lens of your eye. A great way to open the door to cataracts. You don't want to run the Maillard reaction on the uh, elastin fibers in the skin. It's a great way to turn your skin into an old suitcase. And you sure don't want to run the Maillard reaction on the inner lining of the arteries of your brain. I will show you uh, the effects uh, on this and how it uh, ties into vascular dementia. But it turns out, as I'm railing against high temperature cooking of carbohydrates and eating sugar as a food, though, those are not the main sources of AGEs in the Western style diet that is uh, being uh, promulgated these days. It turns out that the major source of AGEs in the modern diet is cooked meat. Um, when you grill the burger, when you broil the steak, when you fry the chicken, uh, well, where's the sugar and the protein that get together? Here, the sugar is the glycogen uh, in the muscle that gets heated up on the grill. It combines with the myosin protein in the muscle, uh, and the heat from the flame creates the AGEs. Uh, and it turns out that um, the cooked meats caused by far 
uh, more HEE production. And that's a problem um, in the blood vessels of the brain. Uh, here you see the middle cerebral arteries of two men who died at the same age. This man in the upper panel did not have Alzheimer's dementia. This man did. And you can see the artery walls are thickened and edematous and inflamed, and they are loaded with the with the AGE damage. Uh, so again, uh, eating cooked meats and lots of sugars, not very gentle with your brain if you want to maintain good mental function in your advanced years. So I'm focused on this so far to point out that you can do great damage to the body by, um, by producing AGEs and oxidized vegetable oils on, with plant-based foods. These are processed junk foods, if you will, uh, but whether it's the, the fries or the sugars and the salty and the chips, uh, et cetera, they can do great damage to the body, even though they are all, quote, plant-based, but of course, they are highly processed plant-based food that make that takes them out of the healthy plant-based category when uh, when humans uh, alter their structure so drastically so i wanted to say that just being vegan does not uh, uh, assure you of of healthy uh, uh, dietary practices by a long shot that's why we use the term whole food plant-based we want foods that you can grow you identify growing in the garden. There's a cucumber, there's a tomato. Those are the kind of foods we're talking about. These may be plant-derived, but they are not healthy in this state. Now that I have made that obligatory uh, uh, acknowledgement, we do have to talk about that most people are not on a vegan diet. Most people uh, in your society, my society, um, there's a piece of animal muscle at the center of the plate in most meals. Um, if not, unless you are a, a Jane or a uh, uh, an expressed uh, vegan person who, who chooses those uh, dietary patterns, uh, you're going to be a piece of cooked animal muscle two, three times a day. And here is what that does to the bloodstream. Here's what enters the bloodstream after every meat-based meal. <laughs> and in my country, if there's no meat on the plate, you call the weight person over and say, hey, where's my protein? So again, we need a meat-based diet. And, and I think most people in uh, Asian nations uh, have that preference as well. So let's see what enters the bloodstream with every meat-based meal. First of all, no one uh, is eating raw meat. Uh, the very act of, of grilling the burger, frying the chicken, uh, broiling the, uh, the beef um, oxidizes the cholesterol uh, in, the, uh, in the animal muscle. And as I will show you, it's the oxidized cholesterol particles that are the most atherogenic when they get into the artery wall. Uh, when you cook the animal muscle at high temperature, you're going to oxidize nucleic acids and, and carbohydrates that produce a fleet of reactive aldehydes, glyoxyl, acrolein, and these are mutagenic. They damage the genes that call forth the enzymes in our cells, and every meat-based meal floods your, your tissues and your chromosomes. Uh, with mutagenic aldehydes. Why do we do that? You know, a tomato doesn't do that. A uh, vegetable soup doesn't do that, uh, but a meat-based meal does. New 5GC is a sialic acid that only animals make, and it sets off inflammatory reactions throughout the body, and meat-based eaters are giving themselves a jolt of new 5GC with every meal. And then there's endotoxin from the slaughterhouse bacteria. Uh, anyone who's spent time working in intensive care unit is very well familiar with endotoxic shock and how lethal uh, that molecule can be. Where does it come from? So I said, it comes from the slaughterhouse. All animals pass through the slaughterhouse, even organic grass-fed uh, beef. And as the digestive system is eviscerated, there's inevitable spillage of the gut contents. And you can take a culture tube and swipe any cutting surface in the meatpacking plant in the slaughterhouse, and you're guaranteed to get a Luxurious, uh, luxurious growth of E. coli, Salmonella, Shigella, Endrococcus, Clostridia, Pseudomonas, every steak and chop and chicken breast that leaves uh, the meatpacking plant has a covering of these enteric bacteria on the surface. Uh, it is then sent to the uh, uh, the meat case at the supermarket where the ultraviolet light shines down and kills the bacteria. 
But as these bacteria die, their cell walls lice and break apart, and that releases this powerful, potent uh, lipopolysaccharide called endotoxin. Nasty stuff, endotoxin. Just take a walk around this daisy of distress and see what endotoxin does. Uh, it um, depresses the heart function, releases histamine, releases tumor necrosis factor, makes your blood clot. Nasty stuff, endotoxin. And it's heat stable. The grilling the burger or frying the chicken does not get rid of the endotoxin. And again, people who are eating uh, a meat-based diet are giving themselves a shot of endotoxin two, three times a day. And endotoxin makes the gut leaky. It increases uh, uh, intestinal permeability that allows food proteins and bacterial cell walls to uh, enter the bloodstream where they have no business getting into, flowing through joint membranes, uh, immune tissues, uh, setting off inflammatory reactions throughout the body. And uh, uh, again, uh, steaming corn or eating a raw salad does not produce this effect. Then there's TMAO, trimethylamine oxide. What is that? That comes from a meat-based diet. <clears throat> the, the food we eat determines the microbes that live in our gut. Uh, if a person is eating meat and eggs, uh, then they're eating lots of carnitine and choline, uh, and that's going to summon up microbes like peptostreptococci and clostridia that love uh, metabolizing carnitine and choline. And they don't care about you. They're just waiting for that next piece of chicken to come down. And they will turn the carnitine and choline uh, into trimethylamine, which your liver will oxidize into trimethylamine oxide. Uh, this is a toxic molecule. It drives cholesterol into the artery walls, prevents HDL from removing it, and sets off inflammation throughout the body. And uh, and uh, we find that the folks that are eating in the paleo style, like the, they think the caveman used to eat, but they really, not even the caveman uh, ate meat three times a day. Uh, but folks who eat that, uh, are they walking around with high levels of TMAO? They sure are. Uh, and this puts them at risk um, for uh, major adverse cardiac events and all-cause all cause mortality. We are, we are not carnivorous apes, no matter what uh, the uh, pro-keto folks try to tell us. Uh, we are plant-eating hominids, and we violate that uh, natural principle at our own risk. Uh, very active cooking animal muscle inevitably creates carcinogenic heterocyclic amines that smear on the gastric wall and setting off stomach cancers, smears on the colon wall, setting off colon cancers. Uh, the meat eaters have far more uh, uh, GI malignancies than the uh, plant eaters do. When uh, one eats a piece of meat and all those amino acids flood up into the liver, the liver responds by putting out a surge of insulin-like growth factor one, uh, the most one of one of the most powerful growth-promoting uh, uh, hormones in the body. Uh, fine if you're a growing child, you want lots of IGF-1 in, in your body. But if you are an adult woman with an early breast cancer, or you're an adult man with a big prostate and some malignant cells uh, in that gland, the last thing you want is a diet that makes you walk around with high levels of IGF-1, but that's exactly what a meat-based diet does. Uh, the um, uh, the heme iron that makes red meat red increases the risk of strokes and cancer. Don't have time to go into the mechanism. And um, less so in your country, but in, uh, in certainly in, in the States uh, and around the world, uh, animals are, are fattened in feedlots and the grains they are fed are often are laced with pesticides and herbicides. They drink water with cadmium, mercury, lead, and that accumulates in the animal's muscles. And so biting into that chicken or that uh, burger uh, delivers the concentrated load of these um, molecules that have accumulated in the animal's muscle. This is what flows through the bloodstream after every meat-based meal. I call it the postprandial red tide. Uh, and these are just some of the uh, toxic molecules uh, in, in that red tide that flow through every cell in our body for hours, day, meal after meal, day after day, um, uh, with a, on a meat-based diet. It's a fatty tide. It's a salty tide. It's a sugary tide. It's antigenic. It's full of uh, phos uh, phosphates, sulfates, 
uh, that uh, form acids that the uh, kidneys and bones have to deal with. As I mentioned, it's mutagenic, uh, damages genes, it's carcinogenic, certainly atherogenic, sets off inflammatory reactions throughout the body and disrupts enzyme systems throughout, uh, throughout the body. This is the red tide that people flood through their tissues and uh, do it repeatedly. Uh, if one eats three meals a day, of uh, over 365 days a year, that's over a thousand times a year, you're flooding the red tide through the tissues. And we know well now that within minutes of eating anything, molecules of that food are flowing through every cell in our body uh, where our DNA lies unfolded and our genes are exposed. And the food molecules wash over our DNA and they play our DNA like a piano. And they turn genes on, they turn genes off. They induce enzymes, they shut enzymes down. Every meal changes us on a genetic molecular level. <clears throat> food brings in not only nutrients, it brings in information. And you don't need to be a geneticist to understand that the genes are going to be turned on by this piece of broiled meat uh, with all these meat-based contaminants are going to be a totally different set of genes that are going to be uh, stimulated uh, by this green salad that bathes the tissues with antioxidants and phytonutrients that quench free radicals, that promote tissue repair, that promotes membrane stabilization. It's the difference between one and zero, an animal-based diet and a plant-based diet. The difference is so profound. In one sentence, your genes may load the gun, but your diet and your lifestyle uh, pull the trigger. You may have a genetic propensity towards a given disease, but whether it actually manifests in one's body largely, not completely, but largely depends on the food you're flowing through those tissues meal after meal. <clears throat> the uh, uh, here's a graphic illustration of the effect of foods on our genes. This left-hand panel is the genetic readout of a man with early stage prostate cancer. And all these red dashes here, these are active oncogenes uh, promoting growth of the cancerous cells. This man went on a whole food plant-based diet just day after day of salads and soups and steamed veggies and chilies and curries uh, for six solid months. They then did another biopsy, same man, same prostate, same genes. And look at how many of these red active oncogenes have now been silenced. This is the power that food has to change us epigenetically. How can we, how can we withhold this information from our patients? We need to empower them with this understanding. Every meal makes a difference. Your body's never not looking. Food changes us in one of two ways, either epigenetically by like new 5GC turns on inflammation, but also the food we eat changes the microbes in our gut and they change us uh, by the neurotransmitters and other products that they uh, release. So in the clinic, when we open the door to the exam room and we see the man with the chest pain, we see the woman uh, with asthma inhaling uh, the bronchodilators, the woman with type 2 diabetes uh, uh, giving herself insulin, the woman grieving over her uh, acne scar starred skin. Um, the textbooks and professors often say, oh, we don't understand. Etiology unknown. Really? Are we not largely, largely looking at the effects of repeated red tides over time, month after month, year after year? Food effects over time equal the health effects. So let's talk specifically about these three diseases. I know time is getting on. We've lost some of the, with that lengthy introduction and our uh, technical glitch there, but let me keep um, sharing these two very important disease reversing mechanisms with you. Now, the issue is, why does it work? Well, why, how is the improvements uh, uh, produced and maintained? Well, first of all, uh, here we are, the person still eating the standard diet full of meats and dairy and oil and sugars and salt. Uh, and meal after meal, the red tide is washing through their cells, uh, causing all of this uh, molecular and enzymatic uh, disruption. As soon as the person says, I can't do this anymore. I'm, I'm done with it. I'm tired of being obese and inflamed and diabetic and clogged up. What do I need to do, doctor? And he said, well, let's get you on a diet based of whole plant foods. And I showed you the example. And I'm sure there's an Asian version with lots of fresh, uh, healthy, whole plant foods. As soon as they make that change, and they go from the animal-based diet, to full of, especially all fried and, and overly processed foods, 
to a diet based on whole plant foods, what happens? Well, most dramatically, first of all, these um, continued floods of molecular marauders, they stop. There is respite. The, the red tide is over and the body now has a chance to heal. Every cell, every tissue has, has self-repair mechanisms uh, that can help uh, reverse tissue damage, but they, they can't be active with the red tide marauders who are constantly washing through the cell every four hours. But once that stops, tissue repair can happen. And look at the mechanisms that happen when this change occurs. Instead of those red tide meat-based marauding molecules, here's what is now washing through the bloodstream. Every meal is filled with, first of all, it's a high water content diet. All the soups and salads and steamed veggies and fruits are full of water. And so there's a surge of water through the body, through the tissues, through the cells with every now whole plant-based meal. It's like taking your cells to the car wash and just flushes out and reduces the concentration of many intracellular uh, uh, destabilizing molecules. But the, that flush of water brings in a, a flood of antioxidants uh, that bathe the, uh, uh, the tissues with uh, molecules that promote tissue repair. Now, as the water content in the blood increases, the blood becomes less viscous. The, the saturated meat fats uh, make the red cells sticky and blood viscosity goes up. Uh, the, uh, the, the physical chemistry of the blood plasma changes. Well, on a plant-based diet, the blood viscosity goes down. It's more free-flowing blood. And so there's a surge of blood flow through the capillary beds, increasing oxygen delivery and nutrient delivery throughout the tissues. And that works very well because the, all the dark green leafy vegetables increase the production of nitric oxide uh, in the artery walls. And that's gonna produce a subtle diet, vasodilation, which helps lower blood pressure, but also due to Puisil's law that I'll show you in a few minutes, a little dilation of the arteries means a big increase in blood flow. So you get this surge of, uh, of oxygen rich, nutrient rich uh, blood flowing through the tissues uh, throughout the body. When you pull out the animal fats in the diet, you're pulling out the arachidonic acid, which is the main driver of uh, prostaglandin 2 production, which drives inflammation throughout the body. You're pulling out almost all the arachidonic acid in the diet, and now all the fats are derived from plant oils, many of which are in the omega-3 family, uh, and they have an anti-inflammatory effect. So you've changed the inflammatory balance in all the tissues of the body and the brain and the muscles and the connective tissue and the kidneys and liver. Such a profound difference. And because all these colorful fruits and vegetables are filled with antioxidants that quench free radicals, the reactive oxygen species of free radicals, um, the free radicals are quenched and that lowers oxidative stress throughout the body. As you change the nature of the food stream, you're going to change the nature of the bacteria that make up our microbiome in the intestine. When one eats a meat-based diet, uh, one is uh, fostering the growth of pathogenic microbes like in the bacteroidetes uh, phyla. Well, when you pull out the meat and now the salads and the soups and the fruits and the grains uh, are feeding a different set of microbes, and that's going to promote the growth of Prevotella microbes and other beneficial microbes that are less pathogenic, less pro-inflammatory, less pro-carcinogenic. So that's going to change. And as an additional benefit, the Prevotella microbes put out um, the molecules that are neurotransmitters. They put out dopamine and norepinephrine and serotonin uh, that gets into our brain uh, and often makes us feel better. People say, gee, I feel better since I went plant-based. I'm happier. That's not a placebo effect. Uh, that's a gift of the uh, GI microbes that are now thriving in the, the plant-based milieu in the gut. When you stop eating the fats and cholesterol of other animals, your own lipid now, a panel is going to improve and uh, be less atherogenic. We'll talk about that. The the uh, our skin oils are made of the fats in our diet, and uh, as the plant oils work their way out into the uh, into the uh, skin, uh, people notice their skin uh, conditions, the acne, the psoriasis, soft change, and their body odor uh, often gets uh, uh, much less aromatic. 
uh, dairy cows are all pregnant now. And uh, as a result, uh, many dairy products are filled with estrogens, they're full of growth factors. Well, you pull those out and there's less likely a chance of breast lumps and prostate cancers. High protein diets are not friendly to the kidneys. Uh, when all those amino acids from the meat hit the, uh, hit the glomeruli, it induces a state of hyperfiltration that over time will lead to kidney damage. Uh, well, that is relieved on a plant-based diet. Uh, respiratory secretions in the lungs get less viscous. People wheeze less. Uh, red, white blood cell counts go down, but yet there's no increased uh, risk of infection. Why? Because the plant eater is not praying their, their bone marrow with endotoxin three times a day. So, uh, so white blood cells go down to a count of uh, 3,000, 2,800. But it's a good thing. It's a sign of just less inflammation. So in a word, when, when we say, well, what changes when a person goes from an animal-based diet to a plant-based diet? In a word, everything changes. You have changed the entire biochemistry and physiology of every uh, tissue bed in the entire body. And that sets the stage for these remarkable uh, improvements that we see. I could spend three lectures on talking about each one of these organs uh, how they benefit from a, uh, a whole food plant-based diet alteration in their diet. Um, such a uh, day of eating, especially you know, the foods that uh, emphasize the legumes, the lentils and beans and chickpeas and dark greens, the, the grains, the uh, the wheat and rice products uh, easily provide enough energy and enough protein to keep uh, all adult human beings well nourished. So let's talk about uh, these three conditions. I know time is getting on here, but how does the plant-based diet reverse uh, atherosclerotic plaques, diabetes, and obesity? Well, let's talk about disease reversal in cardiology. Gorillas in the wild uh, do not generally develop atherosclerosis. They don't get uh, myocardial infarctions and strokes. They die of trauma, infections, and parasites, but they don't uh, get these uh, diseases of civilization. And so uh, the lesson that we to gain here is that you know, we all focus on your LDL levels and statin treatment, et cetera. But atherosclerotic plaque formation is not just a matter of that their LDL is too high. The formation of atherosclerotic plaques is an inflammatory process that's actively being fostered with every red tide lace meal. These artery walls are being injured every four hours, meal after meal. Uh, and uh, first, the endothelial linings, that one cell thin, remarkable, remarkable membrane that produces nitric oxide, uh, that gets injured. Here it is in its native uh, 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 pristine state, uh, but then along comes the meat-based diet with the grilled meats and the fried foods, uh, and so the, the uh, oxidized animal muscle, animal fats filled with free radicals and advanced glycation end products start damaging the endothelial lining. If they like, if you like fried foods, uh, uh, the onion rings and the uh, and the various fried uh, uh, delicacies that I showed you before, you're, you're eating the fryer oil that is filled with free radicals and, and AGEs. When one eats meat, uric acid is produced, and uric acid uh, will in, uh, uh, engage the AGE receptors and set off inflammation, as well too much refined fructose, not the fructose in fruits. Uh, but the refined fructose can also set off advanced glycation end products. The phosphoric acid in cola drinks that gives cola the bite on the tongue, that is also damaging to the field lining. This is the red tie flowing through the artery walls, causing repeated damage to the endothelium. Now, and when the endothelium is damaged, now oxidized cholesterol particles, and we'll talk to you about that, get into the bloodstream. Um, the, the oxidized cholesterol particles, uh, they get into the artery walls. Um, and this, again, comes from the cooked meats. Um, the, uh, the oxidized cholesterol is uh, phagocytized by the, the macrophages that are then, they are teeming with free radicals. They become foam cells that are filled with free radicals. And when and these are then incorporated into the, uh, the inflammatory response, uh, the atherosclerotic plaque is formed here, but it's uh, it's the body, it's, uh, the artery walls response to these uh, foam cells that are, as I say, uh, cellular marauders filled with free radicals.
radicals and and uh, and high uh, oxidative activity. Now, oxidized cholesterol. Cholesterol itself is not an evil molecule. Your liver makes it, so your adrenals can make steroids and your gonads can make sex hormones. And, but uh, you take the cholesterol molecule and you you put it under the that's in the meat, you put it under the broiler or drop it into the frying oil, and you're going to rip electrons off and you turn this cholesterol into cholesterol hydroperoxides. And these are the oxidized cholesterol particles that are so atherogenic. Um, and cholesterol will oxidize just meat in the refrigerator or in the meat locker that that cholesterol is oxidizing. As I mentioned, putting it under a broiler or, or dropping it into a fryer oil is certainly going to oxidize cholesterol. And when you eat meat uh, and drop it into your own stomach, your own stomach acid is going to oxidize cholesterol. So all this oxidized cholesterol is being foisted into the bloodstream. And uh, and it's a major source of oxidized lipoproteins in human serum. Uh, and again, anytime you cook animal muscle or even eggs, you're going to be winding up with oxidized uh, cholesterol. Uh, and beef and pork are among the most uh, uh, cholesterol oxidized cholesterol laden molecules. Uh, and again, uh, so here's those oxidized cholesterol molecules uh, that uh, the reaction to uh, them in the artery wall is results in the plaque formation. Now, most cardiologists say once this happens, uh, it's relentlessly progressive. Everybody's going to need statins and stents and bypasses. And yes, that's what they see. And that's what you're going to see, doctor, if you don't talk to them about changing their diet to one of old plant foods. That's what you're going to see. But the truth is, this is actually reversible. I wish someone had told me this in medical school. I wish someone was telling the medical students this, which is exactly what our Moving Medicine Forward program is, is trying to do, but that's uh, no, that's for another talk here. But this is a reversible disease, contrary to popular belief. And Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn at the Cleveland Clinic uh, made it very clear, if you're not familiar with this clinician and, and, and this landmark book on how to reverse heart disease, please please uh, get this book, read it, and share it with your patients. Uh, Dr. Esselstyn has been published uh, in a uh, family practice journal, uh, took 198 patients. Every one of them had severe advanced atherosclerotic disease. They all had stents and had infarctions. They had angina. These were all almost 200 uh, patients with severely caked up, clogged up artery walls. Put them on a whole food plant-based diet with lots of green vegetables and follow them for four years. During this time, these almost 200 patients would expect to have at least 60 of these 200 would have, in those four years would have had a major adverse cardiac event. And the reality is those four years, essentially none of them had any adverse effect, any adverse event. And those people who had angina, nine out of 10 of them had their angina improved or resolved completely. Those folks in the study group who did not stay on the whole food plant-based diet, over half of them did experience a major adverse event. This is such a powerful finding, powerful study. How can we explain this? Dr. Esselstyn does two things in his program, and you, we all can take advantage of this. First of all, get these people on a diet of whole plant foods. Stop the red tide. Stop the onslaught of oxidized cholesterol. Stop it all. Okay. And instead, bathe those artery walls uh, with uh, all those wonderful phytonutrients that promote tissue repair. So that's the first thing. A whole food plant-based diet. Stop the red tide. Uh, then uh, he has patients... Eat several times a day of a fistful size of broccoli, kale, chard, some type of dark green leafy vegetable. Why does he do that? I will show you. Because here we are in the artery wall. Uh, here's the oxidized cholesterol molecules that were being taken up and producing the foam cells, etc. But as soon as you stop the red tide, and go on a whole food plant-based diet, first of all, there is respite for the artery walls, no longer has to deal with this barrage of oxidized cholesterol molecules. And by eating that helping of dark green leafy vegetable, it's like, it puts like a time-release capsule in the intestine. That, so there's a constant stream of antioxidants seeping into the bloodstream, day, hour after hour, day after day, week after week. And as time goes by, these antioxidants work their way into the artery walls. And if there is any free radical uh, oxidative damage happening, um, the antioxidants neutralize the free radicals. And as a result, with no more free 
radicals to be neutralized, uh, the foam cells uh, lose their adhesion to the artery walls and they outmigrate. You can see it on the electron microscope. The, the foam cells actually leave the artery walls. And as a result, the, uh, the atherosclerotic plaques get smaller and smaller and smaller. And the endothelial lining that has been damaged reestablishes itself, not by magic, but because uh, the bone marrow is constantly putting out showers of stem cells that reupholster the artery walls uh, like new paving stones. And as a result, you get dramatic improvements uh, like this man, a 46-year-old surgeon actually with a severe atherosclerotic disease. Here's his left anterior descending artery in his heart. Uh, this rat-eaten portions here, as you know, these are atherosclerotic plaques encroaching into the blood flow channel. This man went on Dr. Esselstyn's program month after month for 29 months, a meal after a meal of salads and soups and dark leafy greens. And the plaques eventually melted away. The inflammation was quelled. And as the plaques melted away, this artery turned into this artery. Same patient, same artery. Look at the reversibility uh, of this lethal disease. Uh, how can we deny our patients uh, the, uh, the, re the power of what their daily food choices can provide? Dr. Esselstyn also suggests a little bit of balsamic vinegar on the greens that, that increases nitric oxide production in our artery walls, uh, which will produce that subtle vasodilation. Uh, which then takes advantage of Puiseal's law that tells us that the flow of, uh, of uh, blood through the artery will increase by the uh, fourth power of the increase in the radius. So just a little increase in the diameter of the blood vessel means a big increase in blood flow, oxygen delivery, et cetera. So as a result of that, it just here is a myocardial perfusion scan. Red flow, red is good blood flow. You can see how choked off the blood flow here in this person is. But they went on a whole food plant-based diet, stopped the red tide, the, the plaques melted away just a little bit, the arteries dilate just a little bit, Poisson's law comes into effect. In blood flow increases, and this perfusion scan turns it into this perfusion scan within two weeks. And that's why you get these dramatic improvements. Like this patient report from 1977, I saw this. A uh, 65-year-old man with severe angina had to stop every nine or 10 patients. Uh, paces went on a whole food plant-based diet. Six months later, uh, he's climbing mountains in the late districts of the UK with no angina pain. Again, a little melting away of those plaques, a little vasodilation produces tremendous uh, improvement in symptoms. And blood vessels throughout the body uh, increase their blood flow, uh, much to the delight of people at home, but retinas, kidneys, uh, genitals, they all benefit from increased blood flow. Uh, I'm showing this to show you that there is now a growing literature corroborating these uh, remarkable findings that we can all uh, institute on behalf of our patients. This uh, lecture is being recorded. Please come back to the slide and check out each one of these uh, references. Uh, high blood pressure gets better, heart failure, kidney failure. We see uh, GFR rates go up as people take the load off their kidneys. Uh, and the same with heart failure. It's easier for the heart to pump less viscous blood around with sl and through slightly dilated uh, uh, blood vessels downstream. Uh, the, the, the doctors forced to then have acquired the skill of de-prescribing. How do you get people off their statins and off because they, uh, and off their hypertension medications? You, and you, not only can you get them off these pills, you have to, and they will stand up and pass out on you. And so there's a way to, to stop beta blockers and ACE inhibitors. Uh, and uh, this is a, a skill easy to learn. Uh, if anyone likes to, my four-page handout that I give to all my new patients about weight loss and healthy eating, uh, go to my website, drclapper.com, and click on answers and download the health supporting eating plan. You can see what I give to my patients, and you're welcome to share it. So uh, again, uh, cardiovascular disease is eminently reversible. So is type 2 diabetes. And the principle, when people hear diabetes, oh, sugar, too much sugar, high blood sugar levels, don't eat sugar. Yeah, don't eat sugar because of the AGE, but that's not the primary problem in insulin resistance and in type 2 diabetes. The problem isn't the sugar, it's the fats. And it was shown back in 1927 by J. Sweeney at Yale 
he took medical students in his class, first year med students, divided them up into two, uh, two uh, battalions there. And one of the uh, uh, groups, uh, he put it on a high carbohydrate diet to see what lots of carbohydrates, if that would make them diabetic. And so for two days, all these young men, they were all men back then, uh, were allowed to eat were, were sugar, candy, pastries, white bread, baked potatoes, syrup, banana, rice, and oatmeal, a high carbohydrate diet. 48 hours of that, uh, they did a glucose tolerance test. They gave them 100 grams of glucose and two hours later checked their blood sugar. And the vast majority of them were back down in normal range. After eating all that sugar, their pancreas said, yeah, no problem, we, we can handle that. Well, it didn't, it didn't injure us. But the other group of students he put on a high fat diet for two days, the only things they ate were olive oil, butter, mayonnaise with egg yolk and 20% cream. And after two days of that diet, they did a glucose tolerance test, gave them 100 grams of glucose, and every one of these young men wound up with diabetic readings on their glucose tolerance test with blood sugars well over 180, most of them. Now, they're healthy young men. They went back on a standard whole food diet, and they all reverted to normal. But this shows the effect of, of fat on insulin receptors. Uh, and it's the fats in the diet that causes insulin resistance, and that includes the oil and the dairy and the meat fats, et cetera. What happens is this. Normally, um, the um, when we eat something, which we eat an apple, uh, the sugar winds up in the bloodstream. It's got to be moved into the, into the cells to be metabolized. And so the pancreas senses the glucose in the blood, secretes some insulin, engages the insulin receptors. And that in turn activates two kinase enzymes, and they in turn act, me, activate the GLUT4 transport mechanism, uh, which pulls glucose into the cell via the vesicle uh, mechanism. That's how it's supposed to work. But if the person is eating a high fat diet and all the chicken and meat and oils and dairy, et cetera, <clears throat> as the months go by, that fat accumulates into the muscle cells and the liver cells. It becomes intramyocellular lipid. This is not theoretical. Here is what it looks like under the microscope. And this is striated muscle in this black material here. This is fat in the muscle cell. This is intramyocellular lipid that's interfering with insulin production or insulin function. Uh, this is under light microscope. Here it is under the electron microscope. This is fat in the muscle cell that does not belong there, but that's what a high fat diet does. Now, and as a result, um, the fat gets oxidized in the mitochondria, releasing a lot of free radicals and ceramides uh, that inhibit these two kinase enzymes. So insulin knocks on the door, but nobody answers. Uh, the, the insulin receptors uh, do not respond. And so the glucose piles up in the bloodstream. People say, oh, sugar, sugar. But the, but the high sugar in the bloodstream, that's the tail of the dog. That, that's not the primary problem. It's the fats. That's the primary problem. It's the free fatty acids that are the problem. The high sugar is the result. And if you want to research this, uh, just uh, do some searches on intramyocellular lipid and insulin resistance, uh, you'll see there's getting to be a growing literature. Now, if the person is obese, that adds another layer to the insulin resistance problem because the visceral fat in the abdomen is metabolically active. The visceral fat puts out inflammatory cytokines, interleukin-1, interleukin-6, uh, and these are flowing through the tissues and they set off inflammation throughout the body called metabolic inflammation. Obesity is not a state of health, it's a state of inflammation, and it affects insulin receptors as well. And, uh, uh, and again, uh, you're welcome to, to research this uh, about obesity-related inflammation and insulin resistance. But here it is schematically. Here we are back in the muscle cell. It's all loaded up with intramyocellular lipid. Here is that lipid interfering with the insulin receptors on the inside of the cell. But here comes those inflammatory cytokines from the obese abdomen interfering with the insulin receptors on the outside of the cell. No wonder so many of our obese patients become uh, develop type 2 diabetes. The good news is this is totally preventable. You raise a child on a whole food plant-based diet, they will never develop insulin resistance or diabetes. They will never develop obesity. But um, the carbohydrates are clean burning fuel. They don't produce uh, uh, all the, the uh, ketones and acidic byproducts that cause so many problems. Uh, and 
when one just stops eating uh, the, the uh, diabetogenic diet and goes to one based on whole plant foods, what happens? The body says, hey, where all the fats go? Well, we've got fats in the cell, let's burn them. So the intermyocellular lipid on a whole food plant-based diet is metabolized. Uh, and so the insulin receptors open up on the inside as the obesity melts away from the abdomen, the uh, cellular uh, uh, cytokines that are interfering, uh, they recede. And so the insulin receptors open up. And as a result, uh, type 2 diabetes improves and often completely reverses, uh, as been shown by numerous studies. Uh, here, a person put on a whole food plant-based diet compared to the American Diabetic Association diet. The plant-based diet produced a greater uh, drop in hemoglobin A1C. They lost more body weight. They had a better improvement in their lipids. Uh, they lost less protein in their urine. Uh, again, it's uh, ask any gorilla, it's the healthier diet we ought to be eating. And all of us who practice uh, plant-based medicine have patients like Jim here, who was 100 pounds overweight on 30 units of insulin, went whole food plant-based. Uh, 14 months later, he dropped 100 pounds and now he's running marathons. This is not an unusual finding. This is the expected result. Uh, and again, you learn how to de-prescribe uh, insulin and uh, oral hypoglycemic uh, 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 medications. Uh, again, come back to the study, come back to the slide. There's lots of studies uh, validating the reversibility of uh, type 2 diabetes on a whole food plant-based diet. Uh, and, and obesity um, normally naturally melts away by itself. Why? Because the diet based on whole plant foods, lots of salads and soups and steamed vegetables, it's mostly fiber and water is what you're filling your stomach up with. Yes, there's protein and nutrients, but the vast majority of the bulk by weight and volume is fiber and water. And it passes right through the body. It comes out in stool and urine. It doesn't stick to you. It doesn't produce obesity. I mean, how many apples can you eat? How much broccoli can you eat? And you fill your stomach up with that. Now you reach satiety without taking in a lot of excess calories. And so um, you don't need special weight loss programs or Ozempic. Get these people on a diet of whole plant foods and the obesity usually takes care of itself. If it doesn't, then the person's eating pastries and uh, uh, refined uh, carbohydrates there. Uh, and again, studies validating uh, weight loss. So I'm just going to quickly now do a quick literature survey showing so many other conditions improve inflammatory arthritis, including rheumatoid arthritis. Come back and see this slide. Uh, patients with lupus and other autoimmune diseases often get dramatic improvements. And I urge you, if you have such patients, uh, get the book by Dr. Brooke Goldner called Goodbye Autoimmune Disease. She's a physician uh, that put her own lupus into remission with a whole food plant-based diet. I give it to all my patients with autoimmune diseases. Uh, Crohn's disease and colitis dramatically responds to whole food plant-based diets. Uh, Semi-vegetarian diets are uh, remarkably effective in uh, reducing the inflammation of Crohn's disease. Uh, the asthmatic folks, uh, folks uh, wheeze less. Uh, psoriasis and eczema uh, improve well as the skin oils change. Now, yet most physicians, at least in my country and Western society, uh, they totally ignore this. A man just send him to the surgeon or to the internist for statins and stents, et cetera. Um, and we ignore this very powerful uh, healing modality, much to the dismay uh, and distress of our patients. Why don't we change? What is the resistance? There's both professional and personal resistance. Uh, why doesn't my doctor know anything about it? We're not taught about it. You go through four years of med school in my country. No, it's essentially never mentioned, except to talk about scurvy and berry, berry, things that uh, you, know, you very rarely see in practice. And nutrition is not respected as a hard science. Uh, uh, I'm up in the operating room doing real medicine. But what are you doing up in the operating room, doctor? You're dealing with the infections and the infarctions and the amputations of, from what your patients are eating. Well, dealing with the nutrition-based disease. Jesus. And plus, the doctors are eating the same food themselves, uh, so they're not going to be telling their patients not to eat it. And so at the clinic visit, their patient's diet is never really mentioned, business as usual, and the failure to help the patient become plant-based uh, misses the chance to reverse these diseases, to lower the risk of cancers, reverse diabetes, to get that weight off of them, lowers their food costs. Uh, uh, rice is cheaper than, than rice and beans are cheaper than meat and chicken, no doubt. 
so the monetary savings of the systems would be in the trillions and uh and the improvement in human health and the reduction of suffering of people and animals and the and the ecosystem and that's another lecture would be priceless but yet we just ignore it um and when i talk to my colleagues about it they say listen doc i don't know yeah talk to my patients about what they're reading i don't know what to tell them i don't get paid to do this counseling i don't have time to do this counseling now this is an american medical problem but i suspect uh you all uh with these big patient loads are in a similar position well the good news is i don't have time for this counseling you don't have to doctor there are trained professionals who will do this counseling for you just realize you've got a patient with diet-based disease, it was sitting in front of you, overweight, hypertensive, diabetic, clogged up and inflamed from what they're eating. So get this person on nutritional in front of a nutritional counselor who knows how to help them become plant-based. You see them back in a month and see if they're not leaner and healthier. There are professionals in America, the plant-based dietitians are becoming more and more uh, abundant and easy to find, but you may not have them in South Asia, but now what you do have, uh, there's online nutrition counseling in Sri Lanka by dietitians. Now, this is a company I know nothing about. I just saw this on the internet, but I said, aha, even in Sri Lanka, you can get plant-based nutrition counseling. There really is no reason to deny this for our patients. I'm sure there's many other corporations and practitioners, but we need to pull the dietitian onto uh, the patient care team. Uh, it's, the dietetic consultation should not be an afterthought. Uh, if the dietitian should be seen on the very first visit after you see the patient. I want you to see Ms. Singh down the road, down the office. She's the plant-based dietitian. She'll uh, counsel you she'll show you videos she'll take your shopping uh and you eat like she says and you come back and see me in a month let's see if you're not doing better this is the treatment model for the 21st century that we should be considering there's pressure in my country uh, and congress uh, is urging that medical schools provide nutrition education uh, to physicians and fortunately there's now wonderful plant-based educational opportunities available free for the taking uh, I urge people to go to Plantrician University, go to uh, .org, uh, you can, uh, and you'll find ample of video content, webinars, events, lots of plant-based practitioners, uh, plant-based courses, uh, and again, lots of fact sheets and videos, and will really educate you on how to use plant-based nutrition as part of an active clinical practice. Uh, if you just uh, go back to this uh uh, uh, sign on uh, page here, you'll be able to go right to it. Um, the American College of Lifestyle Medicine has a lovely uh, course on uh, food as medicine, uh, just a 5.5 hour course, uh, and you'll get a good foothold uh, foundation as far as using plant based medicine in your practice. Uh, and again, the American College of Lifestyle Medicine that anyone can take advantage of has lots of food as medicine uh, courses available. No reason for us to remain unschooled in this important subject. Uh, the University of Winchester uh, has a wonderful six-week online course in plant-based nutrition. Go to their website and enroll and take this course. I took it and I learned a lot. I urge you to do it as well. So disease reversal. It is possible, and this is where healing begins. And I urge the medical students and residents talk about this with your professors. It'll it'll stimulate uh, uh, inform, uh, stimulate good discussion, and will educate your professors as well. So disease reversal. Uh, it's a thing. There's a, there's already an international journal of disease reversal and prevention. It's free. I urge you to subscribe to it. There's wonderful books now. There's now plant-based nutrition and clinical practice. Uh, please get this book and read it and educate yourself. And Dr. Sarai Stancic, a professor of infectious diseases, uh, overcame her multiple sclerosis with plant-based nutrition, has some great insights in her book as well. So a diet based on whole plant foods is arguably the most therapeutically potent healing modality that any physician is ever going to wield. We need to put this in the hands of our medical students, of our residents, our young professors. Uh, we can't play in a, you know, victim here. It's the food, it's the food, it's the food. So my plea to the practitioners, if your next patient is overweight, hypertensive, diabetic, inflamed, or clogged with sclerosis, yes, order the essential tests, et cetera, but ask them what they 
they eat on most days. And it's full of flesh and sugars and oils and processed foods, et cetera. Get the, refer them to the plant-based dietitian, get the counseling done, you see them back. And people do change. People say, oh, they don't change what they eat. They do change. Uh, everyone now has a rum relative who had a stroke, a heart attack. They're far more motivated than they used to be. Not everybody, but that's beyond our control. But we at least owe them the information. So I'm at the end of the presentation. I say, once you look behind the curtain, you can't pretend you don't know what's behind the curtain. And when I give this lecture to medical students across the, the country and across, around the world now, internationally, um, I I reach a point in the presentation where I ask a provocative question. I say, knowing that most of these diseases are reversible most of the time with whole food the diet and lifestyle practices, knowing that these diseases you're going to spend the majority of your career treating I have to, that are reversible, I have to ask you, you want to heal these patients or you just want to manage their chronic disease? If you're just going to be a manager of their disease, you'll leave medicine. It's a dismal way to practice medicine. You want to heal these patients to get real about why they're sitting in front of you, doctor. It's from what they're running through their bloodstream three times a day. So this has been a report from the front lines of medicine. I've been a primary care physician for five decades. And I'm, I'm shouting back to my colleagues coming behind me. It's the food. It's been the food all along. And take advantage of this powerful uh, modality, because otherwise you're going to be like the blind man and the, uh, and the elephant. And the cardiologist sees the clogged arteries, and the physiatrist sees the inflammatory joint disease, the endocrinologist sees the type 2 diabetes. And they all think they're treating different diseases, but really it's the food their patients are eating uh, and get them on a whole food plant-based diet, and these diseases reverse. I'm the happiest doctor I know. My patients get healthier. Uh, and I and I share the news that the era of whole food plant based nutrition is uh, uh, is dawning, uh, and the the plant based wave is breaking. Line up your surfboard, learn about this, and you can become the happiest doctor you know, um, taking advantage of disease reversal through plant based nutrition. So I I know I covered a lot of material. I hope this has been beneficial, and I'll be certainly open to questions. Thank you very much for your attention. All right. Thank you so much, Doctor. What a wonderful uh, talk that is. And uh, uh, thank you so much for taking some questions. Uh, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Harris Patirage. Uh, doctor, do you have any questions for Dr. Clapper? Yeah, I know Dr. Dr. Clapper actually you know, has another lecture uh, uh, immediately after this, and he's a very, very busy person. Uh, maybe we can take one question. Uh, is that okay, Dr. Dr. Clapper? Yes, I can do one question. Okay, Dr. Dr. Patrick, do you have anything to ask? Could you um, write it in the chat and then I can follow up with Dr. Clapper so he can move on to his can, next. Hello, hello, can you hear me? Uh, yeah, uh, this is a popular belief that, uh, especially in relation to the children, that uh, for their growth, growth of the muscles and the body and the brain, you need to give uh, animal-based diet more, especially in their growing period. Now, is it true or is there any alternative? Whether plant-based diet can supplement this or is an alternative to give adequate uh, uh, protein as well as the lipids? Now, as you know, for the brain growth, you need a lot of cholesterol and sphingomyelin, so the lipid-based uh, diet, whether, it, whether it's supplemented with the animal-based diet and for the muscles also, you need a lot of proteins. So can we uh, change or sh uh, shift to a plant-based diet and get the this uh, protein and the fat for the proper uh, growth of the children's, uh, especially in relation to the brain as well as the uh, muscles and the body? Uh, from what I understand from the question, um, are you going to get enough protein and other nutrients from the, a plant-based diet? Well, I just uh, the animals give us the answer. The biggest, most powerful animals on the planet, elephants and buffaloes and giraffes and gorillas grow to thousands of pounds of mammalian muscle without ever eating chickens or beef. Uh, these are these are vegetarian animals. And clearly the uh, the the amino acids are in the they're in the beans and the lentils and the chickpeas and the nuts and the seeds and the whole grain. There's plenty of protein around. And now with all these magnificent plant-based athletes uh, doing these remarkable feats of strength 
that if you haven't seen a film called The Game Changers, uh, see that film, you'll see these uh, power lifters and runners and tennis players and cyclists uh, performing these magnificent uh, athletic feats uh, on a completely plant-based diet. So the answer is yes, relax. There's plenty of uh, protein and nutrients available in plant foods. If you want to, uh, you don't have to be 